Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to finish the book of Leviticus today, Leviticus chapter 27. Remember in the last chapter, chapter 26, we had the blessings that God will give you if you do things His way and the punishments that He'll bring on you if you don't do things His way. And as we mentioned in our last study, uh, at the end of our last study, today we're going to be learning about uh, vows. And we're actually going to begin our study today in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. There's a few different type of vows that we see people make in God's Word. We'll be talking a little bit about that. But uh, let's go ahead and get into it. We're going to pick it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your Word. We thank you for bringing us together so we can study your word. And we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. So, all right, we're going to pick it up. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. Remember, Ecclesiastes is written to the man under the sun, meaning this book teaches us how to be happy in these flesh bodies, how to be blessed, how to be pleasing to God. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, and it reads, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. And when you go to church, what happens there? Are you being taught God's word or are you doing a whole bunch of other stuff? Many people, they go to church week after week, do a whole bunch of stuff that seems super religious. And just like it says, they don't consider that they're even doing evil because they're not even teaching God's word there. So ask yourself, what happens when you go to church? Verse two, be not rash with thy mouth and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. If you want to be successful, don't just talk about a whole bunch of schemes. Get out there and work hard for it. Verse 4. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. And it even says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 22 through 23, it says it's no sin to not vow. So it's a very wise idea just to not vow at all. Because if you make a vow to God, you make a promise to God, you're bound by that. But why not just do what's right in the first place? Verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Don't try to say, oh, that's not really what I meant. Or, oh, no, I, I didn't actually do it. You can't trick God. And that's going to be a kind of a common theme in Leviticus 27. You can't trick God. You can't. He knows your thoughts. So don't ever forget that. He's the heart knower. Wherefore, why should God be angry at thy voice? And destroy the work of thine hand. You don't want that to happen. Seven, to complete here. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. But fear thy God. Okay, now let's go to Leviticus chapter 27. And what we're going to be seeing a lot with these vows in Leviticus, it's people that were dedicating themselves to God. And, uh, the, and it had to do with that they wanted to help out with, with the tabernacle. And we'll see that even a, a parent could even dedicate his child. And uh, a couple of different types of vows that you see in a few different places in God's Word. One you have, uh, the very first vow you have with Jacob in Genesis chapter 28, verse 20 through 22. Another one you have with Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She was barren. But then she cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, if you'll give me a child, then I, I will dedicate him to you for life. So she, she made that vow and God gave her a child and she made good on that. Her child would be Samuel. Also in 
Uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, um, Israelite, they had sent some spies in, and then um, Arad, the, the, uh, a king named Arad the Canaanite, he, uh, he went and he made war with Israel, and he, he captured some of them, took them prisoners. So then Israel, uh, Israel cried out to God, and Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. So they said, God, if, if you deliver them into our hand, we'll destroy them. And do you remember, that's what God told them to do. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 15, God said, you utterly destroy their cities. They were doing all types of idolatry. They had even intermixed with the fallen angels. So that's what they were supposed to do anyway. So those are a few different types of vows that you see in God's word. We're going to kind of have a different type of vow here in Leviticus. But let's go ahead and get into it. Leviticus chapter 27. And we've read about vows in Leviticus previously a little bit in chapter 7 and chapter 22 and chapter 23. So let's get into it. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 1. And it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, when a man shall make a singular vow, the person shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. That word singular, that Hebrew word in other places, it translates as marvelous and wonderful. But so um, let's go another verse and we'll explain a little more. Verse 3. And thy estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old even unto 60 years old. Even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. So let's explain this, that if, if a male between the age of 20 and 60, if he wants to vow himself unto the Lord, then the, the price that would be estimated would be uh, 50 shekels of silver. So the point is that he, to redeem himself for that redemption, he would, he would pay to the, to the priests uh, 50 shekels of silver. And I think a big reason people would do that is that they wanted to help out in the service of the Lord. So that's what this has to do with here. Verse 4. And if it be a female, then thy estimation shall be 30 shekels. Verse 5. And if it be from 5 years old even unto 20 years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male 20 shekels, and for the female 10 shekels. 6. And if it be from a month old even unto 5 years old, then thy estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver, and for the female thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. So that makes it clear, obviously, it would be the parent that would be dedicating a child that's one month old. Obviously, the one month old is not making that decision. But, uh, and you might even think about the baptism just came to mind that um, infant, to baptize an infant, that doesn't get it done. Because baptism is a personal, a personal choice that someone has to make. I mean, a kid could be very young. A kid could be as young as five or six years old and know that Jesus Christ died for our sins and resurrected. But an infant, that, that just doesn't get it done. An infant cannot make that personal decision when it comes to baptism. And I didn't even plan on saying that, but that just came to my mind right that second. Verse, uh, verse 6, or verse 7. And if it be from 60 years old and above, if it be a male, then thy estimation shall be 15 shekels, and for the female, 10 shekels. Verse 8, But if he be poorer than thy estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him. According to his ability that vowed, shall the priest value him. So as we've seen multiple times in Leviticus, such as Leviticus chapter 5, if someone's poor, that doesn't mean they're excluded from serving the Lord. No, it doesn't mean that at all. God always makes a way. It doesn't matter how much money you have. And we'll, we'll see a couple different times where things we're going to read in this chapter does kind of uh, at least remind you of some things we read in chapter 5, such as the trespass offering. But so this verse, I think it makes it clear that um, everyone had to be redeemed. That, that, that was part of it. And so if you dedicated yourself, then it, it, at least it seems like it to me that you have to pay that redemption price if you want to make that vow to yourself to the Lord. Verse 9. And if it be a beast, so now we're talking about vowing an animal. If it be a beast, uh, wherefore, an, or 
what, let's see here. If it be a beast whereof men bring an offering unto the Lord, so that means this is having to do with clean animals. We learned about that in Leviticus chapter 11. All that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. So a, a clean animal would not be redeemed. It's holy unto the Lord. Verse 10. He shall not alter it nor change it, a good for a bad or a bad for a good. And if he shall at all change beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. So a person can't say, okay, I'm vowing this animal to the Lord, but then re later think, oh, that's a really good one. I'm going to switch this one out for a not so good animal. No, you can't do that. If you vowed the animal to the Lord, it stays. Remember, God knows your thoughts. So don't ever think you can get one over on God. You might even think about in Acts chapter 5 where Ananias, he tried to pull a fast one. Then I think it was Peter said to him, what, why are you letting Satan cause you to lie to the Holy Spirit? What ended up happening? God struck Ananias dead. You do not try to trick God. And that line to the Holy Spirit, that's of course even a type for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 12. But so And so now it's saying that if you try to make a change or an exchange, then, not on, th then you're going to have to, to vow both of them. So you do not do that. Verse 11. And if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest, and the priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou valuest it, who art the priest, so shall it be. 13. But if he will at all redeem it, so the unclean animals can be redeemed. If he will at all redeem it, then he shall add a fifth part thereof unto thy estimation. So that's 20%. If you give an unclean, if you vow an unclean animal, the priest gives the estimation. Then if you want to redeem that animal, then you have to pay not only the estimation, but an extra 20% on top. Verse 14. And when a man shall sanctify his house, that word sanctify is kadesh in the Hebrew, if a man shall sanctify his house to be holy unto the Lord, then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad, as the priest shall estimate it, so it shall stand. And remember, we learned just a few chapters ago about how a land that you inherit you cannot completely sell that land to another person. You can lease it out, basically, meaning they can use the, the produce of the land. But it, and that was the case unless it was in a walled city. Then you could completely sell uh, to another person. But if it wasn't in a walled city, then it was part of the field. And you could not completely sell your inheritance. But this is, uh, of course, speaking of making that vow to the Lord. So the priest shall estimate it. Let's go to the next verse, verse 15. And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. So that extra 20% again. Verse 16. If a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of a field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. And Homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. Now, through my research in this, what I came out to is that um, and Homer, probably an Omer is probably how that should be pronounced, but that comes out to approximately 500 pounds. And I think this, what this is saying is that if it takes 500 pounds to sow the field, to, to sow with the seed, if it takes 500 pounds then it will be valued at 50 shekels. And, um, a f and that of 500 pounds, that would take up approximately a field of about two or three acres, approximately. So that's the type of thing that we're dealing with. So if that's what it would be in Omer, then it would be priced at 50 shekels. And that would be if a person were to do it like right at the beginning, right after the Jubilee year. Because remember, we learned about the Jubilee a few chapters ago. That's every 50th year. And when the Jubilee came, it was a great time of rejoicing because at that time, everything got set free. Any land that someone leased out, it got brought back to the original owner. Bond servants were, were set free. So the Jubilee, a great time of rejoicing. So now let's read the next verse, verse 17. 
And if he sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to thy estimation, it shall stand. So once again, if it's right at the beginning, if they do this, they vow the field to the Lord right after the Jubilee, and there's uh, about 50 years left to the next Jubilee, then one that would be an omer would be 50 shekels. But now verse 18, but if he sanctifies field after the Jubilee, like if 20 years later, and then there's only 30 years left, like, uh, just for an example, then of course the estimation's not going to be as much. So if he sanctifies field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon unto him the money according to the years that remain, even unto the year of the Jubilee, and it shall be abated from thy estimation. That word abated means to scrape off. So, and as we learned in that Jubilee chapter, I believe it was chapter 25, that you do the math according to how much time is left until the Jubilee. So everything is done fairly. No one's getting ripped off. Of course, the price should not be the same if someone was going to have it for 30 years and 50 years. No, the price is going to be different. And so God's law is always completely fair and righteous. Verse 19. And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be assured to him. So we have that added 20% once again. And once again, that reminds us even of those trespass offerings of Leviticus chapter 5. Verse 20. And if he will not redeem the field, or if he have sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. Now, this is interesting. So if he just doesn't redeem the... And actually, I think I need to read the next verse first. Yeah, let's read the next verse, verse 20. But the field when it... Or verse 21. But the field when it goeth out in the jubilee shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted. The possession thereof shall be the priest's. So if a person vows his field to the Lord, but then he just never redeems it, he's not getting it back. It becomes devoted to the Lord and it becomes the possession of the priest. And it's, a, it's an interesting situation how it says if he sells the field to another man. Don't that seem kind of weird that if a person has already dedicated it to the Lord, then he sells it to another person? I mean, that really doesn't seem right, does it? And who knows what would be in a person's mind on, in that type of situation. But it's saying if you do that, you're not getting it back. It's going to the Lord. And, and it's possible, and you're going to see why I'm saying this here in a few verses, but that in this situation it's possible that it would be paid year by year. So if a person sold it to another person, then that person that he sold it to, it's possible that they would be making the payments so everything would still be right monetarily wise necessarily, but to, it doesn't really seem necessarily right that a person would sell it to another person while he's already vowed it to the Lord. So if he did that, it becomes the possession of the priest. It becomes devoted. Shall be holy unto the Lord. Verse 22, now we go to a little different situation. This is the situation of if a person has bought somebody else's field. And remember, you can't outright completely buy it, but it's like a lease that a person, you buy the rights to get the fruit of their land. So that's what this has to do with verse 22. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought, so it doesn't actually belong to him, but he's bought the rights to the, to the fruit of the field, which is not of the fields of his possession, 23, then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of thy estimation, even unto the year of the Jubilee, how many years left until the Jubilee, like we talked about before. And he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. So this seems that if, if it was a person that you bought the rights to someone else's land, if you vow it unto the Lord, you got to pay the whole price that day is, I think, what this is saying here. So that's why it would seem different from before. That That's why I said in the previous situation, maybe they just paid year by year. But in this situation, it seems like he has to pay the whole price in that day. Verse 24. In the year of the Jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought, even to him to whom the possession of the land did belong. And that's what we learned back in chapter 25, that if you lease the land out to someone, if you uh, give it to them, that they have the rights to the produce. 
in the 50th year in the Jubilee, it's coming back to you, to the original inheritance. Of, as God set the lot, God chose the inheritance for the tribes. Verse 25. And all thy estimation shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Twenty giras shall be the shekel. Verse 26. Only the firstling of the beast, which, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it. Whether it be ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. So the ox or sheep, those are clean animals. But So what this is talking about, you find out in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2, the firstling, it already belongs to the Lord. So you can't vow something to the Lord that already belongs to Him. That's what this verse is saying. Once again, you can't try to trick God. Oh, I'll kill two birds with one stone. No, you can't do that. 27. And if it be of an unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation, and shall add a fifth part of it thereto. Or if it be not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to thy estimation. Now this is um, back in Exodus chapter 13, verse 13. When, when that was mentioned, it said that if, um, if it be not redeemed, then its neck was to be broken. But here we have it a little different here. Now we have it that um, if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold. And that money could be used to, to help with the tabernacle and the service of the Lord. God has common sense, verse 28. And once again, all of his instructions are always righteous and always correct. Verse 28. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. Verse 29. Now, this verse 29, you have to understand this verse. It's very important to understand. Verse 29. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed but shall surely be put to death. Now this word devoted here, when it says which shall be devoted of men, that word devoted is kerem in the Hebrew. And many different places in God's word, most of the time it's translated as utterly destroyed. So you have to understand what this has happened, what this is talking about. There are times that God would put a ban on even a certain people. He would, it would be devoted to him, but God would give the instruction to utterly destroy them. One situation would be Deuteronomy chapter 7, the first few verses. When it was speaking of the Canaanite nations, remember, they did all types of idolatry, all types of perversion. They even intermixed with the fallen angels. God told Israel, you go and you destroy them all. That's what God said to do. So, so this is saying that if, if that's the situation, if I told you to utterly destroy them, they can't be redeemed. They're to be put to death. And another situation we had this was 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul, the first man, king of Israel, God told him, you utterly destroy Agag and the Amalekites. God said, you kill them all. But what did Saul end up doing? He killed them all, but he did not kill the king who God said, you kill him. You destroy them all. And then Saul saved um, some of the good animals, some of the good, uh, some of the good, the sheep, the oxen, and the lambs. But no, God said you destroy them all. So Saul disobeyed a direct order. And that made God very, very unhappy. That, uh, that would be a big part even leading to Saul's downfall. But so this is saying, God is saying, if I say you utterly destroy them all, you destroy them all. They're not to be redeemed or anything like that. They are to be put to death. And that's what this verse is talking about. Verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Verse 31. And if a man will at all redeem all of his tithes, he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof. So this is saying that if, if let's say that you, um, a, a tenth part of your animals, that's dedicated to the Lord. So let's say that um, you had just dedicated, uh, or this is the, with the tithes actually. So let's say you just tithe the cow to the Lord. But all of a sudden, you really need a cow for whatever reason. This is just a completely hypothetical situation. But let's say all of a sudden, you, you need a cow right now. 
you were able to redeem that cow back. You were able to get it back. But if you did that, you had to add on an extra 20% when you bought it back. You had to add on an extra 20% is what this is saying. Verse 32. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. And, uh, th and that, that's what they would do. They would they'd hold the rod out and the animals would walk by and he would, he would tell or he would count. So one, two. So what this is saying is that um, the, the tithe mean the Every tenth one is to be holy unto the Lord. That's what this is saying here. Now, verse 33. He shall not search whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So once again, you can't try, don't try to rip off God. You can't trick God. And you can read uh, when it talks about um, it, uh, allusions to like the sheep passing under the rod. Make note of Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37, when it, even God saying, I am the shepherd and you will pass through the rod, meaning God feeds us. He is our shepherd. So make note of that, of Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37, and also Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 13, when it has to do with sheep passing under the rod. But so what this is saying that don't, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just explain. So let's say you got the sheep passing under the rod, one, two, then all of a sudden you see the tenth one, which the tenth one has to be dedicated to the Lord for the tithe. You see the tenth one and you say, oh man, that's really a good one. I don't want to lose that. So then you go seven, eight, nine, nine and a half, ten, and you tr you try to rip God off. You can't do that. And it's saying if you end up doing that, then you got to give them both. You got to give the one you called nine and a half and ten. So of course, don't try to rip God off. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Verse thirty-four to complete the book of Leviticus. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Now we're going to go and we're going to read just a couple of verses in 1 John chapter 2 is how we're going to finish out this book of Leviticus. I briefly want to mention with the tithe, Malachi chapter 3 verse 10, where it says, bring the tithes into the storehouse so meat can be brought in. And the point in what you do, you tithe where you are fed the truth of God's word. And it, it's saying, uh, watch, I'll open the heavens and pour out a blessing that you, that you can't even handle or that, that you just will overflow with blessings. That's what it says in Malachi chapter 3. But don't ever let someone try to rip you off and guilt trip you. Tithing is between you and God. Me or no one else has anything to do with it. Don't ever let someone try to guilt, you, guilt trip you into it. God doesn't send beggars. But now I'm, I'm going to read uh, verse 34 again, and then we're going to go to 1 John chapter 2. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. And now I want to mention also Jesus Christ would say in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now we're going to conclude. We're going to read about five verses in the first epistle of John chapter 2. And we're going to be reading about Jesus Christ here. And remember, we have been taught about Jesus Christ all throughout the book of Leviticus. How the animal sacrifices were to be without blemish. And Jesus Christ became the sacrifice. He was without blemish. He was without sin. By his stripes we are healed. Isaiah chapter 53. We learned about the feast days in Leviticus chapter 23, such as the Passover and remember 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus Christ is our Passover. So we learn about Jesus Christ all throughout the book of Leviticus. Such a fantastic book. What, what has Leviticus been about? Teaching us how to worship the Lord. And of course, you know from Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 17, the animal sacrifices and the ceremonies and the rituals, those were nailed to the cross. Those were done away with. Jesus Christ became those things. He set us free from those things. But the moral laws remain the same. Like we mentioned multiple times throughout our teaching in Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 19. Saying don't put a stumbling block before the blind. Don't curse the deaf. 
don't steal, or are those things done away with? Of course not. God's moral laws stay the same. Now to complete the book of Leviticus, let's go to the first epistle of John, chapter 2. You got epistles of John near the back of the Bible, right before Revelation in the book of Jude. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Do our very best that we don't sin. But we saw in the first epistle of John, if you read it, we all do sin. But when you do, just confess, and God is faithful to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Continuing in verse 1, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is, the, um, he is our advocate. He's the intercessor. Verse 2, And He is the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation means the atoning sacrifice. I mean, all these animal sacrifices we read about in Leviticus, where it was so much dogma, so much, I mean, so many rituals, so many ceremonies. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice once for all. And he did away with all that. To where now all we have to do is repent and your sins are washed away. Remember Hebrews chapter 9 verse, 14, verse about 12 through 14 saying how they did all those animal sacrifices. Then it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ cleanse you and give you a clear conscience? First, uh, for continuing verse 2, And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Verse 3, you see why we came here now. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. For he that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Verse 5, to complete our study in the book of Leviticus. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Yah Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for our studies in this book of Leviticus. We thank you for bringing us together so we can study your word. And we just ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit to do your will and just to, for us to learn what you would have us to learn. And we ask that you continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. This was recorded in the year 2023 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.